Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. John White, Chief Medical Officer at WebMD, and you're watching Coronavirus in Context. Have you heard about these variants, the New York variant, the California variant, the Brazil variant, the South African variant, the UK variant? We've been talking about variants for a long time. But what impact does that have then on our behavior and the news? Are we covering them too much? So to help provide some insights, I've asked my good friend, Dr. Eric Topol from Scripps. Dr. Topol, thanks for joining again. Oh, it's always great to be with you, John. Now, you coined this word scariant, where even with little data about a new variant, we have it on major news channels. Are we covering it too much? Or other people will say, you know what, we need to be transparent and get the information out there and let the public decide. Well, I think it's really a tricky, John, because, you know, everybody has kind of grown up with the term mutation. Mm -hmm. And that means, you know, there's some change in a letter of a, um, a gene code. But here we're talking about 20 mutations, uh, 10 in the business spike protein uh, part of the virus. So it, it gets this term variant and it only gets upgraded to the term strain when it has true meaningful, important differences. Nice. So we only really have one strain right now, which is this UK variant. And that one is, uh, it, it, the others mostly are in the scary uh, category whereby we have some concerns. Uh, most of them have are innocent. In fact, the most important thing to leave you with today, John, is all variants are innocent until proven guilty. Yeah. And so often it's reported, like the California variant was reported as the devil is here, but there isn't any proof that it's guilty. So why, how can you say the devil is here when there's no proof? So if we assume the best, which we should for, for variants, uh, then what we want to only take as a high bar threshold when you prove that the, the series of mutations leads to something that is meaningful, worrisome properties. And there are three properties, right? One is that it can be more infectious. The second is it can be more virulent, that is cause more deaths, more hospitalizations, more severe cases. Uh, you know, and the third one is that it could have this immune evasion feature, whereby even if you've had COVID, you could get it again because your immune system doesn't recognize it, evades it. Or if you get a vaccine, it might not work as well against this because it's different than the what the vaccines were built on. Yeah. So those are the three properties. And so far, we really don't have one variant or strain that has all three, which is good. We, that would be the monster, right? Uh, we have one that's the most troublesome, which is that UK variant, because it has both the issue of transmission, infectiousness by 50% or so more, and then it also has appears to be, you know, more uh, with fatal and severe illness. So that's the one we have to be worried about because in the U.S. it's seeded everywhere, and in a couple of states, namely ours here in California, and in Florida, it's up around 20 percent. When it gets to 40 percent, that's when you start to see the trouble. So we are in this kind of phase where we're lulled into. Uh, you know, that everything is good and the cases are coming down and we could see a big turnaround in, in a few weeks. But how do we really know how widespread these variants are? Where there are some estimates that less than 1% of samples, some people are saying it's 0.5%, are tested. And then we have to extrapolate it to a broader population. Are we really that good at math in determining how widespread these variants are if we're doing such little testing, and I should point out, indiv individual patients can't request variant testing and, and can't you know, even get the information back as to whether or not they had the variant. So how realistic is it when we say how widespread it is on, in the public media? Well, what's happened is ever since this whole issue of the variants arose, and you remember up and through the calendar year, of 2020, it really wasn't a problem in the US. It was at the very end in December and since then where we started to have this uh, awareness. 
So genome surveillance is going into high gear. Mm -hmm. So in San Diego, for example, we're, we're uh, now sequencing 20% of the samples. So not 1%, not what it was 0.3% countrywide. Mm -hmm. And so things are going into high gear for sequencing because you mentioned an important point. If you have a vaccine and you are a rare person who fails, namely you get COVID, yeah. after your two doses and a couple more weeks and you're at full immune response. And we, we need to sequence that because we need to know what is the root cause for that. Um, and also, you know, I don't think we have to sequence all. No country is sequencing all except perhaps, you know, very small countries like New Zealand or, 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 or um, Australia are a high proportion. Even the UK is only sequencing about six, seven percent. So we're going to get up to that level. Uh, in the meantime, we know what we're dealing with, and we know that uh, the screening, there's a, before you actually sequence, there's a, uh, a thing called S-drop, which is a, a assay that's run. And we can tell what's going on now okay. around the country. And that's why we know Florida and California are the trouble spots. The rate of new cases seems to be plateauing in some areas, and people automatically ascribe that to the variants. Do we know that? Well, we had in recent weeks this tremendous descent, uh, really kind of unprecedented, even though we had, of course, recovered from a monster surge. Uh, and then the question is why? Because, you know, we don't have enough people vaccinated to explain that. We don't really have enough people with natural infection immunity to fully explain that. Is it behavior? Are we more geared up because of the, the scariants and, and the real variants? I, you know, what is it? We don't really know, but what we are worried about now is that we have one trend coming down, which is great, and then we may be starting to see the other one going up. And in between where we are right now, you could miss it because it could be flat. Uh, and so only in the next two or three weeks will we know where we're headed. If we dodge this, if we don't get the beast of B117, it'd be phenomenal because then we kind of have a, a clear path to you know, an exit ramp. And so this is what's in our way because the other immune evaders, like the South African you mentioned and the Brazil and possibly New York, which is looking troublesome. Those, what do they do? Well, they don't transmit so much. Their main issue is that they could cause you know, reinfections or the vaccine resistance. That's a tiny problem relative to hypertransmission and lethality increase. So we can deal with those better. And they will, they may slow a little bit our exit, but they won't be anything like this B117. Does the presence of these variants make you rethink whether we should delay the second dose to get more people vaccinated? Yes. Um, you know, I had been against the second dose change because I like to stick to the protocol and you have all these great trials with 95% efficacy. But right now, um, there's three alternative dosing schedules that could get more people to start with their vaccine immune response. That doesn't mean we wouldn't give a second dose, but it means that they may get it, you know, at six weeks or eight weeks, you know, instead of at four or three weeks. So, I'm in favor of that now, as well as the half dose Moderna, where there is a randomized trial that looks very good, as well as not giving two doses to people with prior COVID, because one dose looks quite good. So if we use that, those conserving strategies just for the month, while we're waiting for, we have a supply issue right now, and we have a B117 potential onslaught issue right now. So if we just use this, these strategies to get us through a replenishment and rich supply of vaccines, we might be able to help fend off this one major obstacle that's holding us back. Because variants won't survive if there's no host for them to infect. So the more people we get vaccinated is, is a good thing and, and we need to have some speed with that. Last thing I wanna ask you is about preprint and really about pre-preprint. And, and recently you expressed frustration, maybe even some anger over that people are commenting now actually on drafts of, of manuscripts that haven't even been submitted for preprint. Where is this going? And is there a push to be, some people will argue to be provocative 
mm. on the news because that's going to get you more interest. But aren't we supposed to talk about science and listen to the scientists and then we're putting out draft documents that haven't been subjected to any type of review? Yeah, well, let's talk about preprints, a great question. But before I get to that, I just want to emphasize one thing. A lot of states now are going into major relaxation modes, okay. you know, getting rid of their mitigation, whether it's your restaurants and gatherings and, and whatnot. And that's the wrong thing to do right now, because we, are, we may be facing our biggest challenge yet. All you have to do is ask people in the UK, Ireland, Portugal, Israel. I mean, this, this is they had the worst of the whole pandemic. And remember, uh, you know, countries like some of them really had controlled things all the way through. This can be, a, you know, a real beast, but we'll see. Uh, but don't relax now. This is the time to keep getting containment so we're ready. Now, the preprint thing, I was really stirred by this because on Monday, when the LA Times came out with The Devil Is Here, and they talked about a preprint which hadn't been published, and here it is Friday, it's still not published. I can't review that data. Well, I can because journalists sent it to me. And in fact, like every, every different newspaper had this preprint, except for the preprint server. Yes. Okay. And so, it's you know, pre -print I thought, print. that's why I'm saying that. Yeah. It's a pre preprint. You know, the whole idea with preprint is that it's really important. You post it so that the whole biomedical community can look at it and can make their own assessment. You know, is this real? And, you know, how, how good is the evidence? So this one hasn't even been posted. And meanwhile, it became New York Times, Washington Post, uh, you know, started uh, Sacramento Bee and LA Times. It was on every news channel about the, you know, the California variant and this. I really got upset because you know what? If the investigators believe it's so important, why is this preprint not published or not posted? Now, then later in the week, there was another twist of this, which was very different. So one of the best uh, science journalists um, uh, at the New York Times, Apoorva uh, Mandevilla, she published a preprint of, from Caltech about the New York variant. And she also had gotten a copy of the Columbia Medicine uh, paper that was gonna be posted the following morning, which essentially replicated the, the uh, Caltech. And that, that variant is concerning the proof is still, you know, not there, but it looks like it's an immune invader, not a B117 beast transmitting uh, virus, hypertransmissible virus. Anyway, it was reported responsibly. It raised concerns, but there again, when it was published, that preprint wasn't available to look. Only one of those, the Caltech one, was. So, without getting too, you know, that one was small compared to the California variant. Uh, that one, I think, qualifies as capital S scariant because we still don't have the thing to look at. And that means it's not the journalist's problem, in my view, John. It's the researchers. If they're sending preprints to the journalists and making claims, then why aren't they posted? You know, we already have embraced preprints during the pandemic in a major way. But the, the issue here is that you know, it only takes a day or two to get something posted and then everybody can look at it. If you're going to talk to the journalists, it's kind of a, it's worse than a press release because yeah. now you're really trying to inject all the science in there and you're showing data. Uh -huh. It's not like a press release right. and it's getting published in newspapers that we rely on for facts mm -hmm. and we can't check it out. So I'm asking that we, whenever the journalists publish about preprints that at least we know it's posted mm -hmm. or it's imminently posted for sure that you could check with the, the bio archives or med archives, or whatever, because that we need to weigh, weigh in on that. We need to help uh, others interpret for the public and for the medical community. Is this the real deal or is this a scaring it? Yeah. In the meantime, we need to be aware, but to your point, not scared. And when we have questions, we can turn to Dr. Eric Topol's Twitter page. So I encourage everyone to follow you on Twitter. I want to thank you, Eric, for always providing us the facts, the insights that we need to stay informed uh, and to be safe as well. So thanks for all you're doing. 
Oh, hey, John, thanks to you. You're literally in the way, and I'm glad to join you today.